Today we welcome Rick Archer to Skeptico. Rick is the creator and host of Buddha at the Gas Pump, a website and YouTube channel that features an amazing collection of interviews with all sorts of interesting thinkers, spiritual teachers, and enlightenment-seeking individuals. Rick, I'm a big fan of your show, and I'm so happy to welcome you to Skeptico. Well, the feeling is mutual. I started listening to your show uh, for the first time last Tuesday, and now it's Saturday, and I think I've listened to six or seven of them, which means you know, over an hour a day I'm listening to Alex while I ride my bike and wash the dishes and stuff, and uh, I'm thrilled by it. I'm going to continue listening, and, and you know, just you and Bill Maher and Bill Moyers are my, are my favorite podcasts now. <laughs> okay, wow, that's, that's quite a group to lump me into, and, and I have to say, you know, this kind of mutual admiration society, but I feel similarly and really stumbled across your site about a year ago and anyone who searches for any variety of well-known spiritual teachers is liable to bump into Buddha at the gas pump. I did, didn't really latch onto it too much and then I kept hearing from listeners here and there, oh, you know, here was an interview with that person from uh, Rick and then I really dug into it and was amazed. What you'll find if you go to Buddha at the Gas Pump are these interviews, over 150 of them at this point, with just a lot of little morsels, nuggets of little insights that you can take and work, and, and some you'll dismiss, and some you'll kind of dig into more, but there's just so much there. Tell us a little bit about the concept behind Buddha at the Gas Pump and how it all got started. Well, I am a long-time spiritual practitioner myself. Um, been meditating regularly since the 60s. And so I naturally have a genuine interest in this stuff. And I was, and I, I also have, have always liked asking questions of people. Um, I, I would look at, you know, Oprah or, or uh, you know, Larry King and people like that and think, I could do that, you know, because <laughs> uh -huh. I just have a natural curiosity. And I, my mind is always thinking of the next question. Even while I'm listening to your podcast and you're talking to some guy, I'm thinking, okay, now ask this. Uh, <laughs> and so I was out in the garage one day working out on my Bowflex machine, and, and the idea just kind of popped into my head, hey, do an interview show. Um, and one thing led to the next, and there's a lot of details, but that's how the, the idea originated. And initially I thought of it as a sort of a, a local radio show that I would do here in my hometown with about a 10-mile radius of broadcast, low-power station. And friends kept saying to me, that, you're thinking too small, you know, you should be out on the Internet, you know, make it bigger. So that's what ended up happening. Great. And, you know, so, Rick, as we dive into this, there's going to be a lot of folks who listen to Skeptico who are going to be very much in sync with what you're talking about. And there's other folks who are going to be a little bit more uh, kind of leery and, and, and not quite into it. So I thought where we might start is by breaking down some very simple terms, but maybe terms that we throw around that aren't so simple. And I could start with this idea of enlightenment, this idea of awakening, which anyone who encounters your site is going to immediately run into those terms. What are we talking about? What is enlightenment? What is awakening? I'd like, to, I'd like to give you a, as deep an answer as I can and to, and to provide a sort of a context which will be a foundation for our whole discussion here perhaps. And that is that um, you know, we human beings, and in fact all beings, all sentient life forms, are like filters. We're like you know, lenses. We're like peepholes, if you will, which, which can glimpse a certain you know, perspective on the world but obviously can't take into account the whole thing. I mean, if we put you and a moth and a chameleon and a bat and a cat all in the same room, each being would be seeing something completely different according to their perceptual capabilities. Now, scientists tell us that uh, you know, if we boil it down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, we get down to a sort of a, a ground state, a quantum field, a unified field, as it's sometimes called. And there's debates about, you know, what that is or whether it's been confirmed and, and so on. But as I understand it, that, that's a very good model or metaphor at the very least, if not an actual real correlation for what enlightenment is. The unique capability of a human being, which bats, despite their ex uh, exceptional hearing abilities or you know, fruit flies, despite their exceptional smelling abilities, they can smell a glass of wine at a thousand yards, um, don't have is human beings have the capacity to actually consciously become aware of that field, of that ground state of existence. And it turns out 
when you when you when that awareness dawns, you discover that that's what you are essentially. Uh, you are not as uh, uh, what what the term you often use a, a biological robot. <laughs> you are that, but in a relative limited sense. But more fundamentally, more realistically, more deeply, you are essentially the ground state of the universe. You are the intelligence from which the whole thing arises. And we can elaborate on that because that might arouse skepticism for me to just say that. So enlightenment is that conscious realization, it, to, to my way of using the word. You know, you're, you're right in that that is, to a certain extent, controversial. And to another, in another way of looking at it, it shouldn't be. But let, let's deconstruct that because what I was really hoping to do, or one of the things I wanted to do, was connect the work that you're doing with these first-person accounts of people who say, hey, I got to this state, this state called awareness, awakening, and this is what it's like, and here's how I did it. And then connect that with maybe some of the work that we're doing, which is also kind of coming at it from this logical, rational science standpoint of saying, is that true? Can we trust that? Can we test that? You know, which is the other thing that, that I, I think we're all doing. There's a lot of overlap. I don't mean to kind of make them as in two camps because they're not. But I'd start with this whole idea of consciousness because you just touched on it. And as you also alluded to, you know, in the in the science world that we live in, that even that is controversial. It, it's more than controversial. It's not accepted. It's not accepted that you are conscious. You know, and I think we can kind of blow past that because, oh, hey, we all know we're conscious. We all know we have a free will. Yet we live <clears throat> in a society, in a culture where those ideas are not in keeping with the mainstream paradigm. And I think we always have to remind ourselves of that, that, you know, the science news we're reading, the science reporting that we're getting is built on this assumption that, yeah, you are this biological robot. You are your brain. So how do we... I guess, how do we, we make that leap and get past that? And I guess what I bring that back to is meditation or some kind of practice, because the teachers that come on to your show often are talking about some kind of practice. So maybe we could talk about that practice and meditation and how meditation brings us to that, brings many people, I should say, to that first-person realization that that model I was just talking about is not true and that there really is a you to you. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, as you say, the mainstream culture is has a certain mindset, uh, but it's it, it takes a while for the mainstream culture in any age to catch up with the, the leading edge of, of thinking. And, you know, by and large, the mainstream culture is probably still in a Newtonian mindset, whereas 100 years ago, quantum physics dawned, and the mainstream culture hasn't caught up with that. Uh, even mainstream science hasn't caught up with that. Um, and, you know, quantum physics tells us that, uh, you know, essentially life, uh, all that we see as apparent material stuff is just a, a kind of a quantum fluctuation in a field of all possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we don't live our lives that way. But perhaps enlightened people see the world that way. They, they actually are living... Um, the reality of what quantum physicists are postulating. So, as far and you know, many people and throughout history, there have been people who have expressed that kind of perspective. Many of whom have used techniques and modalities such as meditation and other things to bring about that realization. And even in spiritual circles, there it's argued sometimes that techniques can't do it for you but I, the, the spiritual authorities I respect you know although they say maybe a te technique doesn't cause enlightenment there was one Zen guy who said uh, enlightenment may be an accident but spiritual practice makes you accident prone so <laughs> yeah so techniques and practices uh, if if they're effective and I think there are probably varying degrees of effectiveness but you go for what makes sense to you and you do it and maybe you move on to something else after a while and and over time you culture even on a physiological basis the ability to 
uh, have the kind of recognition here that we're talking about. And there has been a great deal of research on various kinds of meditation, uh, transcendental meditation, Buddhist meditation, Vipassana, and so on. And, they've, and you've heard of neuroplasticity, that the brain changes as a result of experiences we have. Well, the brain changes as a result of meditation, dramatically. And, you know, people who've been practicing a, a meditation technique for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, there's a guy you might want to have in your show named Fred Travis who's done a lot of study on this and uh, you know their brains function in a quite a remarkably different manner which I'm not really qualified to get into the details of than the average brain um, so you know we're instruments as I said earlier we're, we're maybe I didn't say but we're we're like sense organs of the infinite we could say and as such we can intentionally enhance our ability to sense, to tune in, um, not only to various relative strata of experience, many of which you talk on your show, talk about on your show, but to the foundation of all those relative strata, the ground state of, um, of the universe. Boy, you know, I, I'm with you right up until the ground state of the universe thing, and then I, I, I just pull back a little bit. We'll not play with that. that. <laughs> no, yeah, we, we should. Yeah. We should play with that. I think that's a, a fair term. And you do a wonderful job on your show of being inclusive of a lot of different spiritual traditions, modalities of teaching, and at the same time being skeptical, I guess is no better word, of some of the obvious contradictions and paradoxes that arise whenever you get there. So, But what I wanted to do next was kind of backtrack even a little bit when we just took that baby step and said, okay, clearly by the hard science that we might love so much, such as neuroplasticity and those kind of things, we can prove that this materialistic biological robot thing falls apart, right? I mean, if you can have a thought in meditation, and that can change the physical structure of your brain, well, then you kind of have a chicken and the egg problem if you're a materialist, right? What came first? This brain that you claim is the source of everything, or the thought which just changed the brain? Mm. But let's jump past that, because we've already kind of said that materialism kind of falls apart. If you well, there are two schools first. of thinking there. There are those who say that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain functioning, and right. there are those who say that consciousness actually gives rise to the whole material universe, including the brain, and, and which is an interesting thing because it, exactly. it's sort of it's a bootstrap process whereby consciousness creates forms which eventually can recognize consciousness. So it's, it's, it's a way of playing hide, conscious, that consciousness plays hide-and-seek with itself. Which kind of brings us to the, the, the paradox and the contradiction thing that I wanted to get into because it's so fascinating on one side, kind of intellectually it's fascinating, but it's also challenging on another level if you're really trying to get your arms around this stuff. Because on one hand we have the materialists, the scientists, really the atheist crowd who's saying, okay, you're just this biological robot. And then we get past that and let's say we move into some of the folks that you're talking to and we go to boot at the gas pump and we go, oh no, there's more, there's this universal consciousness. And it can wind up sounding a lot like the same thing that we hear, well, that we started with, which is this is all an illusion. So how do we get, get past that contradiction, or should we? Is this all an illusion? The consciousness as we know it, are, are, are we really back to creating an illusion of a, a reality that isn't really there? Well, certainly, I mean, just in terms of perception, with some of the examples I used earlier of different kinds of animals, um, you know, what we see as the world is our human interpretation of it. And each human, each seven, one of the seven, what is it, seven billion humans has a slightly different interpretation. But like, for instance, uh, it's now speculated, and uh, with some physiological research to back it up, that birds have receptors in their retinas which can actually turn the magnetic lines of the earth into visual phenomena so that they can migrate by actually seeing little lines that they can follow. Um, so is that an illusion? Well, it's a, it's a con concept for a human being, but it's a reality for a bird, if, if that's true. Uh, now, physics would tell us that if you remove all the empty space from... Let's, let's take all seven billion people in the world and remove all the empty space that's between all the part of the subatomic particles in their bodies and 
you know, collapse it down to just neutrons, protons, and electrons, let's say, you end up with a, an object about the size of a grain of rice. Um, so there's not much there, and yet we perceive these solid physical things. And then take that grain of rice and begin to analyze the subatomic particles, which make up the protons and neutrons and so on. And, you know, you get down to the point where those aren't physical anymore, and they're just sort of, you know, statistical fluctuations in, a, in an underlying field. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like, go ahead. But, but, but wait, because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm with you, but then we're kind of abstracting it back to this uh, scientific level that, that doesn't hit people where they're living, you know. Hey, I have problems. I got stress. Yeah. I got, I got deep existential issues of who am I, you know. So I come to a, a teacher, and the teacher says, let go of the story. Oh, I see where you're going this with that. This is an illusion. Yeah, yeah. You're, uh, you're not really here. You are attached to something that isn't real. So in a, in a funny way, we've kind of come full circle. We haven't really come full circle, but it, it's all an illusion. How do we, how do we process that? Yeah, I would never that? say that to somebody. I think it's irresponsible. I think that, you know, we could say knowledge is different at different states of consciousness. Reality is different at different states. The, the quantum physicist who realizes that fundamentally there's no such thing in, as gravity because on a level there's a certain mo most basic level of of nature where gravity hasn't yet arisen can't go jumping off buildings by virtue of that understanding and expect to live uh, so somebody who says you know I'm going through terrible problems I've lost my job uh, you know my my kid is on drugs or whatever that stuff needs to be dealt with with compassion and understanding and a recognition of this uh, the, the relative reality of that experience it does no good to the person to just say it's all unreal. Um, what about what about attachment, though? How do we balance that? Again, a, a contradicting paradox. How do we balance that with attachment to both our problems and our solutions or our feelings of you know liberation or enlightenment? Isn't that a reality too? Yeah, and you know again back to the word enlightenment. My understanding of enlightenment is not just some recognition of the abstract, you know or maybe not so abstract, the foundation of the universe. It's, a, it's an integration of, of that with all levels of life, uh, being able to sort of raise a family, have a job or whatever, and yet do so while gr grounded or established in being, if we want to call it being. Um, so, you know, we're kind of, we could say we're multidimensional beings. And enlightenment is not just meaning locking into one dimension to the exclusion of another of, of the others. It's a, a fully integrated incorporation of being able to function on all levels simultaneously, or at least to move between them according to the need. I, I think that's I think that's wonderful, and, and I really uh, appreciate that, which means I agree with it. So, uh, <laughs> but but I, I I am struck sometimes by. Um, how much people kind of want to move past what's going on here and now. You know, whether you talk about psychedelics, which is a, a topic that I, I want to get into later, but it seems to have come up now, so let's talk about it. You know, the psychedelic experience and this idea that I think uh, Terence McKenna coined the idea that we need to perturb consciousness. You know, the best way to really get a handle on consciousness is to perturb it. And there's something intellectually attractive of that, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, there's something about uh, asking the fundamental question of why. I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to come back to this, you know, this ordinary consciousness, and it seems like we have to deal with that. And I'm not putting down the use of psychedelics, and I could substitute for psychedelics almost any spiritual practice, you know, breathing, uh, deep meditation, anything. But at the end of the day, I'm, it seems to me that we're geared to come back and deal with this experience. Tell me what any thoughts you have about that or any thought, any of your favorite guests who have kind of dealt with some of these issues. Sure. Well, psychedelics were how I got my start on this whole journey, and I, I perturbed the heck out of consciousness for about a year, you know. <laughs> and after about a year of, of you know, pretty serious perturbing, you know, <laughs> I was a mess. I dropped out of high school. I, I couldn't, you know, stay at home with my father. He was kicking me out of the house all the time. And, and you know, and basically I, you know, I'd, I'd messed myself up both subjectively and in terms of my outer life. But what I realized from the whole experience was that 
a lot depends on how you perceive the world. That the world is not just taken. You, most people just take for granted that the world they perceive is the world that is. And psychedelics blew that out of the water for me. Uh, but you know, if I had been continuing on that path all these years, I probably would be dead by now. So I personally, I found for me something that was much more wholesome and constructive. And that within you know weeks of practicing it had transformed my life. I'd gotten back into school, gotten a job, reconciled with my father, had all kinds of practical significance. But at the same time, was opening me up to deeper levels of experience in a way that was much more gratifying than drugs because it was natural and much more stable. You know, you you take an acid trip or something, you come down after 12 hours and and it's gone. But Genuine spiritual practice, genuine spiritual development, is an integrative process which grows by degrees and which you don't lose. Uh, people sometimes say, "Well, what good is meditation? Because you're having experience while you're doing it, and then you got to go back to your regular life." That's like saying, "What good is eating a meal? You know, because you know you you've got to go stop eating after a while, but the meal stays with you. It, it goes to build tissue in your body and so on. And same with same with a spiritual practice. It it has a cumulative of influence over time. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. That's good. Hey, let's swing back and talk about science again for a minute. You know, there's this saying in science that I, I, I really like, and I like the history of it. It's shut up and calculate. So <laughs> back in the 19, you, were, you mentioned quantum physics, that really the pioneers of not quantum physics were over 100 years ago. But those folks got to a point where they said, hey, you know, the philosophical implications of what we've discovered here with quantum physics, I mean, this idea of entanglement and experimenter effect, as you summed up really nicely, kind of violates all these other ideas we have because it fundamentally says we can't really measure things like we think we can, and therefore maybe science isn't what we think it is. But they reached a point where they said, well, what are we going to do with this? And they, they adopted the idea, well, shut up and calculate. So, you know, the, the direct TV satellite system in my living room relies on shut up and calculate, which is just do with what we have and see if we can make something practical out of it. And the reason I, I bring all that up is because, I, again, I think we bump into that in the spiritual practice as well. And it, there's two, si two ways the way it cuts, I think. One way is, hey, this practice works for me. I feel better. I feel like a, a different person, a better person, whatever that means. But there's a side of me that doesn't want to go there necessarily, wants to pull it apart and says, you know, how do we test that? How do we know that your practice really is genuine, is efficacious, is any of these things. And if you get into these discussions with people, a lot of times, and I, I, I don't want to pick on Christians, but fundamentalist Christians are the, the easy target on this because you can push them and you can say, well, you know, you, you kind of believe in this book and you believe in inerrancy, and here, you know, we have all these records that show that it's not inerrant, that it's not historically what you think it is. And you'll eventually get to this shut up and calculate thing, which in spiritual terms is, hey, it works for me. So any thoughts on that? How do we deal with the it works for me versus is this really, uh, is this the best I can do in terms of a spiritual practice, in terms of a belief system? Well, uh, yeah, I just listened to your interview with Chris White. Or white, I think his name was. That was yeah, yeah. It was interesting. Uh, fundamentalist, uh, not a, uh, you know, sincere Christian who was going to great lengths to defend a particular perspective, and you know, sho shoehorning the data into uh, you know uh, that perspective um, with almost to the point where he wouldn't let you speak. He kept talking so much, and you would try to say but but, and he would keep going. Um, but I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> now. Personally, I'm, I'm not a scientist, either by profession or anything else. Um, but I like the, the principles of science, I think, which is why I like your show, which is that things you know, should be verifiable by direct experience, not only by one person, but repeatedly by other people who choose to go through the same steps that that person went through. And I think that, that 
can apply to a great many spiritual practices. You know, you can come in with a skeptical attitude, and many people do, and do a certain practice, and you will, if you follow the instructions and do it regularly, you'll begin to have the kinds of experiences that others have had, which you may not have believed you would, but you actually do. It just happens. Um, so that's a short answer to your question. Was uh, there might have been more you wanted me to say to that? I think that's a great answer. Yeah. I, I think that's I think that's the scientific method, in a very practical sense that we all use and apply every day. I, I think that's one of the problems with science is sometimes we kind of want to remove it from our everyday life. And I think what you summed up there is exactly what we all do. Hey, is this working? Do I need to test it more? Oh, I'm going to test it some more, and it continues to work, and then. I can rely on it. Well, oh, and I should just add, that, you know, I, had, I mentioned it earlier, but I should just add that there has been a great deal of uh, physiological and sociological and psychological research uh, conducted on meditators of various stripes. And, uh, you know, some rather profound things are seen. And in some cases, the research is used as a PR tool, you know, and, right. and, un, and undesirable um, outcomes are not published and so on. But a good deal of it is done with a great... Uh, you know, a, a lot of integrity and uh, rigor, and um, published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. So something is definitely happening, and um, some of it is quite remarkable. And like you've said many times in your show, there, if people wh whose paradigm uh, conflicts with those findings tend to brush it under the rug or dismiss it and not even look at it, but it's there, and it's I think becoming harder and harder to ignore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to talk about a sensitive area for you. I want to talk about TM. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can go there. It's something you have talked about on your show. And I think it's it, it, it's right there. Talk about sweeping stuff under the rug. I think it's something that comes up to anyone who's really honest about looking into any spiritual practice. And that's the, if we broaden it a little bit, you know, the guru phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in enough spiritual practices over the years, not uh, as, as deeply maybe as you have, but to see this happen again and again. It, it, it's funny. It's like the old MTV uh, series on, you know, the, the, the rock and roll guy, you know, the band after band that, you know, makes it big, has all this money. Waste it all on drugs and is now broke. You know, it's over and over again. But well, we see this with the guru phenomena. You know, great spiritual insights, huge following, sexual indiscretions, money uh, mismanagement, and and deception. What's going on with the guru thing in general? And how did you process that as it kind of unraveled with your TM experience? Well, since you mentioned rock and roll, there's a great line by the band from the song The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, which is, you take what you need and you leave the rest. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, TM was invaluable for me. It transformed my life. It saved my life. You know, I mean, the direction I was going, I was starting to mess with heroin. My, some of my friends ended up dying. Um, so, you know, and it, it turned me around like phew, night and day. Very profound. And I had all kinds of wonderful experiences over the years and great times with Maharishi in, in person and so on. And the TM movement booted me out about a dozen years ago because I was becoming too independent in my thinking, really. That's what it boiled down to. Um, because org organizations of every sort, political, spiritual, and so on, seem to get, you know, they have their own mindset and, and they don't like people rocking the boat too much, um, thinking outside the box too much. And, uh, but that was great. It was, it was a perfect step in my progress to be booted out and to be able to step back and reassess all my assumptions and, um, you know, not take for granted all, many of the things I've been taking for granted all these years. I still meditate, although it's actually, strictly speaking, not TM because I got a different mantra from a different teacher, uh, but I do it TM style. Uh, but I have nothing but appreciation for you know everything I derive from it and for all the wonderful people that are still involved in it and so on. Uh, regarding sexual scandals and all that, and almost every guru, including Marshi, has been prone to them. Um, I honestly don't know what to make of it because I had been raised so spiritually with the concept that higher consciousness correlates with higher ethics. 
Uh, and of course, ethics is a, very much a human thing sometimes. You know, what one culture considers ethical, uh, such as polygamy, is not ethical in another. Uh, but, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, there's, there's a sort of a universal agreement that teachers in a, in a, peer, in a position of authority, you know, many years older than trusting innocent students, shouldn't mess with their students, you know. And there's also the universal, I think, even more universal code of we tell the truth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when We're, that is violated, I think everything falls apart. Uh, so you, you're, uh, and I don't want to cut this off because this is interesting. What is it? Or is there anything about this, this spiritual devotion that makes the leaders more prone to this? Or what, like you just you summed up the question. Now I want you to answer it. What is going on? Why why does this happen again and again? Well, I don't have any absolute answers, but a, a theory that I play with is that um, you know, and I'll, I'll just say teachers because it's not exclusive to anyone. There are quite a few of them who fallen prey to this, um, they're raised in a certain culture. It may be an Eastern culture, and it may be an ashram in an Eastern culture, which is you know very re relatively cut off from the general society. So they undergo you know decades of development in that context, in that milieu, and they and there are certain aspects of their personalities which I guess you know modern psychologists would call shadow things or so so on that just are never faced, never confronted, until they suddenly find themselves transplanted to the West, you know, with, as you say, hordes of devoted, beautiful young followers, and, you know, tons of money available, and so on, and all sorts of things get triggered, which they hadn't even recognized were part of their makeup, they hadn't even realized that they hadn't dealt with those things, and so they indulge in them, or fall prey to them. That's just my theory, there might be other explanations for it, but that's one of the best that I've been able to come up with so far. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, morality and higher consciousness aren't correlated, but it's not like the, the legs of a stool where you pull one leg and all the other legs follow to the exact same degree. It's more like really big stretchy rubber bands <laughs> where, you know, there's, there's definitely a tendency for morality to follow, uh, you know, correlate with higher consciousness, but it's not, it's not tight. It's like Ken Wilber talks of lines of development, and he's, you know, he, he says that the lines can get quite out of sync with one another. One can be highly advanced along one line and relatively immature uh, in other lines. Mm -hmm. Any practical advice, I guess, you give someone in seeking or becoming drawn to uh, a guru? Because, you know, that's the other part of this. Let, let me interrupt that question with mm -hmm. another question. Is Talk about the guru process, because in the in, in our Western culture, we can then jump to the conclusion that oh, we should dismiss uh, any thought of a guru or any devotion to a teacher, and 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 I don't think we should go that far either. What what are your thoughts on on how we balance that? Well, I always uh, try to avoid black and white thinking in any sphere, and I think there's tremendous benefit potentially to be derived from association with a guru and there may also be a time to leave I mean there's tremendous benefit to the chick to be in an incubator for a certain period of time and then there's a time when they've hatched and they, they should probably get out of the incubator and stretch their wings and I think any guru with his salt actually doesn't want you to maintain some kind of subservient dependent relationship with him for the rest of your life you, they want you to sort of stand on your own two feet at a certain point, and some gurus will actually, you know, f kick you out of the nest <laughs> at a certain point and say, oh, go do it on your own. Um, you know, you, so I would not discourage, I would encourage people not to dismiss the guru phenomenon um, out of hand. Um, it has, if you feel drawn to associating with some teacher, great, but keep your eyes open, you know, I mean, don't, it's so easy to fall into a kind of a cult mentality, and um, uh, and listen uh, to uh, back uh, gap. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> well, that, that'll I, mix I, it up for is, you. The, the, well, I, I, in all seriousness, you know. Hold on, I just lost my uh, my earphone. Sure. But in all seriousness, I think that's a great service that Buddha at the bas ga that Buddha at the gas pump does is expose people to a, a variety of uh, teachers that you can kind of dip in and at a very safe internet YouTube level uh, 
decide a lot of things because uh, you, you do have that distance. Do you think that is part of what you do? Was that intentional on your part, or, or do you see people using boot at the gas pump in that way? I don't know if it was one of my initial intentions, but I'm very aware of it, and, I, and people do use it in that way. And one principle that I've kind of gotten more and more clear on as I've gone through this process is that we're all on the journey. I, I found a St. Teresa quote recently in which she said, it appears that God himself is on the journey. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've come to, oh, whereas I used to think of enlightenment as a sort of a static, superlative, you know, terminus, and you're, you get there and you're totally done, I, I now see it as never-ending refinement and unfoldment and and you know there might be some elements of enlightenment or the fundamental element of, of consciousness itself which in, a, in and of itself doesn't change but the clarity with which that is is appreciated and the degree to which that is integrated into your relative life uh, there's no limit to that and I, I, I'm not sure if I deviated from your question but uh, yeah, so I know why I said that, because, you know, it's easy to sort of glom on to a particular teacher and say, this guy knows it all, he's, he's, he's the ultimate perfect master, or whatever. Um, I would just take that with a grain of salt, and, you know, whereas you don't want to be a dilettante necessarily in hopping from teacher to teacher, there can be a value in committing to one teacher. On the other hand, you know, just recognize that teachers themselves are human beings, and that they too could be growing and, and could be in need of certain, you know, development and of understanding or experience or compassion or, you know, various human values, uh, just as you are. Yeah. And, and again, I, I can't stress enough how great it is to have the opportunity to be exposed to the variety. I mean, the smorgasbord really... Uh, the 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 whole process puts it in a perspective that you couldn't get any other way than to have one person kind of dig into these issues one after another with these different teachers gives you this ability to kind of get a perspective that you couldn't get any other way. Really, really think that's wonderful. Mm. Hey, let's switch gears for a minute and talk about the, the skeptics and how we process the skeptics. And it's interesting to me that for the most part... <clears throat> You don't go there, and you don't need to go there. You've just kind of bounced past that and said, okay, well, that we don't need to worry about. I have this first-person experience that says there's something real here. There's something worth pursuing. But at another level, I've found that both because this was my path and because uh, maybe because it was my path, I've bumped into a lot of other people that it's their path too, is they feel that that's a bump they need to get over, and that's that what about these other people who are saying, hey, this isn't so, how can this be? How do we process the skepticism that is out there in our culture, the, the, the rejection of this idea of spiritual advancement, consciousness development? How do, how do you process that? Well, you know, it's funny. I anticipated that question, and I, and I looked. I did a Google search on predictions that turned out to be wrong, <laughs> and there are all kinds of things here. Um, you know, television. The world is the word is half Latin and half Greek. No good can come of it. Some guy said that on the uh, you know early days. Um, what could be more palpably absurd than the prospect held out of locomotives traveling twice as fast as stagecoaches. That, that, that was uh, in the Quarterly Review of 1825. That the automobile has practically reached the limit of its development is suggested by the fact that during the past year no improvements of a radical nature have been introduced. That was from Scientific American in 1909. I'll give you one more. Um, where a calculator like the ENIAC today is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons, computers in the future may have only 1,000 vacuum tubes and perhaps weigh only one and a half tons. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes on and on, you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, and you know how it is, I mean, 150 years ago, uh, if we could get in a time machine and go back and talk to people like, you know, Mark Twain in the Connecticut Yankee in King, King Arthur's Court and uh, tell people, try to describe to them what life was going to be like 150 years hence, we would get very few believers. 
and yet now we all take this stuff for granted. So, you know, people kind of get um, anchored and hypnotized by the culture in which they live and assume that things couldn't be radically different than that, despite all the lessons of history. So, you know, the question of whether we're entering into a new age and, and you know, there could be a sort of an age of enlightenment right around the corner and all, um, I think we should be more open to the possibility than many people might be, despite the evidence of all the dire situations in the world, um, because history has proven time and time again that things continue to change radically. And we know, and, we, and in our lifetimes, the pace of change has been accelerating exponentially. Um, so, with regard to skeptics, you know, I think when, when you first invited me to do this interview, I thought, oh, this is going to be some skeptical guy who's just going to hit me with all kinds of skeptical questions. But then when I began listening to your show, I thought, well, oh, this is the kind of skepticism that I consider healthy and that I really enjoy, which is to, you know, question everything, but keep an open mind. The kind of skeptics that you sometimes run up against are just the flip side of fundamentalists. You know, they're, they're fundamentalist non-believers, and then you have the fundamentalist believers. Neither of those are scientific, and neither of those are really spiritual seekers in a sincere sense, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, and, and I guess there's, there's two other ways I, I think we can go with that. One is to examine why that position is so popular. Uh, because it is, and it's it's been elevated in our society to the level of really it, it is the status quo, and uh, it, it it'd be interesting maybe to explore why we are so drawn to that, why we are so drawn to materialism, which which is really rather obvious. I mean, we're drawn to materialism because it makes us feel good, because it makes us feel in control. I'm on my computer. I make my computer do what I want it to do. You and your other life. Are, uh, own a company that does search engine optimization. What can be better than that? You're higher in the ranking. You succeeded. You achieved your goal. So there's just an innate attraction that we have to this materialism, and with it goes a skepticism of anything that suggests that this world we see that we can control isn't all there is. So. Any additional thoughts on our attraction to materialism? Because it doesn't go away, right? It, just because we have a spiritual awakening, our attraction to, you know, this control, this materialism, it doesn't go away, does it, Rick? No, and there are a couple of things from what you said. I mean, one is that I think we tend to become habituated to, <coughs> I mean, we, we're, human beings do become habituated to whatever they're experiencing. And uh, after year after year after year of only experiencing gross level of phenomena, um, you know, we kind of get calcified on that level of experience. And so anything outside the realm of that experience seems mystical to us or woo-woo and it's easy to discount it. That doesn't jibe with, you know, an understanding of quantum physics, but most people don't, you know, study quantum physics. Um, and what was the second thing? I knew there was a second thing. Um, um, oh, I was going to say, and, and then, you know, but peop, a lot of times people like you know, Eben Alexander that you had on your show, you know, they, they are of that mindset, and then they have a mystical experience, whether through near death or whatever. And it's not, not, in, not in Eben's case, but other people, it's psychedelics or whatever. And then they realize, whoa, there's actually more. You know, I was just right. scratching the surface here. Right. Um, and so I think people, you know, if skepticism and materialism is the predominant mindset, then it must mean that the majority of people in the world are locked into that level of experience. But it seems to me, you know, that we're in a time now when deeper levels of experience are becoming more and more common. You know, we're not living in an Ozzy and Harriet world anymore, you know, the, this this doesn't look like Kansas, Toto. Um, and, uh, you know, right and left, people are wake, awakening to deeper realities. It's becoming a, a kind of a cultural epidemic, I would say. Mm -hmm. And there probably will come a time, and there probably have been times, if not on our planet, then certainly in other planets, we can get into that, where, you know, a f an appreciation of the full range 
of of creation, full range of reality, is the norm rather than it's kind of like in the summertime. You know, you can dive into the lake and go nice and deep. In the wintertime, you're limited to ice fishing, and there's these if you if you cut a hole and drop a line, maybe something tugs uh, on your line, but you don't really know what's down there. So most people are sitting on top of the ice, but the ice is thawing, and I think a time will come when we're all accomplished scuba divers and we can explore the whole lake top to bottom. <laughs> Hey, uh, that's awesome, but let me let me jump over on another side, play devil's advocate a little. Sure. Bit. Because one of the real discoveries for me that both, I don't know, saddens me, but is, propels me forward and, and gives me uh, hope of understanding things a little bit better is to understand that the skeptics aren't just what they seem to be either. The skeptics are serving a function. Yeah, and a function that our culture has ordained, and our 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 system of uh, capitalism has has promoted, and that is, you know, if you look closely at the skeptics, they're not so much skeptics as defenders of the status quo. So you you take any topic, they're on the side of the status quo. So if it's genetically modified foods, you might say, well, where do the skeptics stand on that? Well, they stand with Kellogg's. Or if you talk about vaccines, well, they stand with big pharma. If you talk about global climate change, which I, I think is, is interesting and a topic I want to get into, hey, they stand on, yeah, it's happening, even though you could make the case of, you know, real skepticism would, see, would be, where is the proof? Show me the evidence. And certainly at this point, to dive into that a little bit, clearly the evidence has come forward that it was all along no more than a, than a multi-trillion dollar uh, sham to try and create a global carbon trading business. And that's what, wh whatever science was behind it, it was really being propelled by people who stood to make a, just a ton of money by trading carbon credits. And that's what was driving whatever science was behind it or whatever reality was behind it. So you're and saying that you're actually a climate change denier? Oh, well, at this point, there's nothing to deny anymore. I mean, the, the most recent data that's come forward that is ordained by uh, the UN and everyone else shows that clearly in the last six or seven years, there hasn't been any increase in temperature of any substantial amount that would, that would support the model of this carbon this carbon reflective kind of thing. So, but I, I take it away, and, and rather than say carbon denier or anything, or climate look. change denier, what I prefer to, to kind of uh, look at is what are the underlying systems that are driving this, and are they real in the sense that we think that they're real, and pulling that apart. And in this case, again, I don't have to choose denier or believer. I just have to say the reality is, what, what, there was this element that stood to make trillions of dollars by trading carbon credits, and the only way that was going to advance was by advancing this science. And now the science has come out and, and, and said that, you know, the, the old model that we had didn't work, and that's why we go towards a different model. But I don't want to get too far into this. Yeah, I mean, I could get into a whole debate with you on that, and I'm not the best qualified person to do it, but, you know, the the temperature in the Antarctic has risen 10 degrees and, and I don't exactly I don't know the time frame but the, the penguin populations are dying the ice is melting Greenland is melting like crazy and um, you know the uh, there's just to me I'm and 95% and of the climatologists whom I don't believe are stand to make any money from c trading carbon credits are on the side of global warming being real. So, but that's a, you know, so I'm surprised to hear that, that you were so kind of almost fundamentalist, fundamentally, fundamentalistically, whatever the word is, uh, assertive about uh, the fact that it's a hoax. But uh, I, I, I didn't say it's a hoax. I don't know. And, and, and let's not get too far into that data because it's a whole other discussion. It'd be an interesting show to have. I'm just going with the, the best data that, that I've seen that says the models that we have, you know, just don't stack up in terms yeah. of the kind of decisions we've made. But let me bring well, that. The, the, let's just say the best way to leave that, get some really respected climate scientist on your show who, who asserts that climate change is real, and you guys have a debate about it because I'm not qualified. 
I, I'm not going to do that because I'm not qualified, and that's not my that's not my show. My show, <laughs> though, does say that we have to look beyond the surface level explanation for things. Oh yeah, and we we have to dig into that. And and I guess I would also tie that back from a spiritual teacher standpoint to this idea of activism because we can take that little discussion we've just had and then look for it as it bubbles up in terms of activism. What should I do as part of my spiritual awakening? Should I go advocate a certain position? Should I get involved in a political way about making change in something? And uh, let me stop there and say, what do you see as the link and the responsibility for spiritual development, spiritual awakening, and activism, namely political activism? I've had people on my show uh, who, you know, claim to have had a spiritual awakening, a, an abiding one, who are all across the political spectrum. Um, some very conservative who would, uh, but, you know, I'd say most liberal. And I, an article just came out recently, some study showing that spiritual awakenings tend to shift one in the direction of more liberal political views. Um, I can't, can't cite the study off the top of my head. As far as what one should do, uh, I think it's totally... Now what, uh, now, what one should do, Rick, should one do, should one do, is activism part of a, a deeper spiritual growth? I think it depends on your dharma. You know, I think some people should be, um, you know, just working a job and taking care of their family if that's what they feel called to do or be a musician or you know be a scientist or you know go join doctors without borders or you know go and you know march on wall street or you know just people have different inclinations so i i just wouldn't want to sort of suggest any universal prescription or even suggest any universally valid correlation between spiritual unfoldment and um political or ecological uh, or social activism. I do think, tend to think that political and social and ecological activists tend to be more sensitive, refined, aware people, but that's just my observation, I don't know. Uh, but it's like different strokes for different folks. I, I, I couldn't give you a pat answer. Uh, it, it, it's interesting because an ongoing philosophical debate Discussion between my wife and I mm -hmm. always centers around this one kind of spiritual story that was shared to me by a, uh, through Ram Dass's book about his guru and a, a, a very important spiritual teacher to me, Neem Karoli Baba. And he, Ram Dass tells this story of uh, Neem Karoli Baba sending him on a mission with this one woman to go deliver this medicine to this ch to these children, mm -hmm. and they get to a pass. And a guard sits, stands there and says, pay me, bribe me, <laughs> right. give, me a, give me a bribe in order to get through the pass. India. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and Ram Das says, hey, you know, we, we, can't, we can't bribe this guy. That would be dishonest. That would be immoral. We can't do it. And his friend, uh, his Dharma sister, the woman says, are, are you nuts? We get this medicine down to these kids, and they're not blind. We don't get it down there. They're blind. We pay this guy a few rupees. What a week here. we got to get this medicine. Yeah. And I, I, I see that as, as such an interesting story because it, it encompasses to me all the complexity that we're talking about in terms of activism, in terms of doing, in terms of or, 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 or not doing. And... I don't know that there's an answer that I latch on to in that, in that dilemma, but I do think to me it sums up the question of, you know, when do we take action and do we have to be careful about the action that we take? Any thoughts on that? Essentially, the, some stories from the Gita come to mind, or the Mahabharata come to mind. There are all sorts of stories in which, um, you know, Lord Krishna, who's supposed to be the embodiment of God, um, cajoles the, uh, the Pandavas, Arjuna and his, his brothers, into, into bending morality, bending ethics in order to accomplish certain things. Like there was a point in the battle where uh, this elephant named Gatokacha had been killed and, you know, and Yudhishthira, the, the head of the Pandavas, uh, Krishna had him do this, called out, Gatokacha, 
the elephant, is dead because Gatokacha was also the name of the son of this other warrior and, and the other warrior was completely crestfallen as a result of that announcement, not knowing he was referring to an elephant, not his son. <laughs> so, so there's, uh, you know, there's all the, the Vedic literature is full of all these sort of paradoxical conundrums where right and wrong is no longer as black and white as we would like to think it is and it, it kind of stretches you to, to read that stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I hear what you're saying. I mean, it can take a thorn to remove a thorn. There can be an, possibly a need for um, something that, well, your story about uh, Ramdas and the medicine is a perfect example. Um, See, I'm more drawn to Ramdas in that, in that story. Mm -hmm. I'm more drawn to... Don't bribe be the guard. Very, be, be very careful. Be very careful about the unintended consequences. Be very careful about, you know, back into climate change. Be very careful about buying into the idea without exploring the great force of end justifies the means thinking. Because I think we live in a culture, in a society, in a United States government that has conditioned us to believe that, hey, you know, a little bit of torture, you know, maybe, maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. You know, we, so we had to bomb Baghdad. We killed thousands of innocent children walking to school. Hey, you know, well, in the grander scheme of things, you know, we're still the best place on earth to live, you know. And uh, uh, not that we aren't the best place on earth to live. I haven't seen all other places, so I don't know. But I think this end justifies the means thinking. Oh, I think you're right. I thought you're totally right. And all this stuff is, is murky waters, you know. It's not, it's not black and white. And, um, you know... None of us is spotlessly pure, and none of us is 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 utterly is you know evil. Um, so, I, I, and we're speaking in generalities here. We sort of have to deal with each situation as it as it arises to really make sense of it. Um, but I, I don't know. It's it's hard to give sort of flip judgments on on stuff. And you know, and in an issue like climate change, I mean, if if Antarctica were to melt. Uh, we, we'd have a 600 foot rise in sea level which would kill billions of people uh, so this stuff is serious business and there could be people with ulterior motives to trade carbon credits and make millions of dollars billions of dollars or whatever but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know the principle of the thing is wrong just because some people are trying to cash in on it true true enough true enough <coughs> I tell you what because you, you kind of touched on Another topic I, I really, really want to get into because it's another one that is often swept under the rug but is really right bubbling underneath the surface of spiritual advancement. And that's the idea of evil mm -hmm. and, and good and whether there is such a thing as evil. Mm -hmm. And let's stop right there and, and tell me how you, how you sort that out. I sort that out with the understanding that um, if you're going to have a relative creation, apparently, maybe it could have been some other way, but the way it apparently is, is that you have to have pairs of opposites. You have to have polarities. If you're going to have hot, you have to have cold. If you're going to have fast, you have to have slow. And if you're going to have good, you have to have evil. Um, you can't live in a, in a dualistic universe without those pairs of opposites. So that's your, the short answer to your question. Let's take it the next logical step. There's evil. Evil exists. We see it all around us. We therefore, in the process of saying something's evil, we're saying that there is good. Are we also saying that there is a moral imperative? That there are. We've we've already talked about morals. Are morals real? Are there universal moral truths that we should follow? Uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that, but I do. <laughs> I, <laughs> are I'm any not, of us? That's I'm, a big one. That's, that's God's question, but let's bring it down. Yeah, but I do feel that what ha often happens is that we anthropomorphize God. You know, I've, I was listening to a skeptic or an atheist on Bill Moyer's show not long ago, and she was saying there couldn't be a God because look at all the horrible stuff that happens. Why would right. why would God do horrible stuff? She's humanizing God. She's yeah. saying he should be like I would want. A person to be, um, but if we understand God to be sort of this omnipresent, all-engulfing 
intelligence that you know entertains itself by by sort of spinning worlds within itself and playing within those worlds appearing to lose itself and rediscover itself then a anything from auschwitz to uh you know shangri-la are possibilities and um you know but one more proviso on this um and the, this again is my personal perspective. I I do feel that the the universe is one big evolution machine, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, you know, presuming that the cosmology is right, and it starts out with some kind of big bang, and then over billions of years stars form, and eventually those stars live out their lives and explode and create heavier elements, and those heavy elements eventually find their way to planets and eventually evolve into the bodies of every particle in our body was once in a star. Uh, there seems to be this sort of evolutionary direction to things which um, move, it appears to be moving in the direction of um, self-recognition of the intelligence which gave rise to the whole thing in the first place. Uh, I am one, may I become many. The oneness needs duality in order to create structures through which it can enjoy itself as a living reality, not just as an unmanifest reality. And so that may sound kind of ab abstract, but the... Um, so in terms of morals, that's too human a term for me, but in terms of there being um, an evolutionary direction of things in the direction of uh, greater and greater capacity for the intelligence which, which gave rise to the universe to express itself and reflect itself in a living way, that, that seems to be the trend, the tendency. You, you may be right, and abstractions may be the only way we can deal with that, but let's try and pull it back down. You mentioned Eben Alexander uh, a minute ago. Of course, he wrote a New York Times best-selling book, Proof of Heaven, after having a near-death experience. Neurosurgeon, highly, highly regarded, Harvard Medical School, all that stuff, is converted, as you say. Comes back and tells us, and we can just lay this down along all the spiritual teachers and enlightenment seekers you had on Buddha at the gas pump and kind of compare and contrast, but he comes back with very concrete answers. Is there a moral imperative? Yes. Are we meant to do good in this way? Is this good? Is love good? Is uh, caring for other people? Is Yes, these are good things. Is there God? Yes. Is there heaven? Uh, yes and not leaving out the possibility that there's more, but that there is this state. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with him, or I'm not saying I disagree with him. I agree I'm with just... him. I can agree with all the things you just said. Uh, I was taking it out to a more abstract level, a more kind of cosmic universal level, and, and in attempting to explain why the bad stuff seems to be happening um, and how everything is moving in a certain direction. But uh, that doesn't contradict the things Eben Alexander just said that it's definitely better to do good than bad. It's definitely better to, you know, all the things you just said. I won't reiterate them. Okay, then let's jump over on the other side. One of the debates that seems to just really drive people nuts. Oh, oh and let me just add one more thing. The reason it's better is it actually serves the purpose of what I was just describing. It's more conducive to the evolution of the life form that you are. Maybe. If it, it, culture, it cultures your nervous system in, in, the, in the direction of greater refinement rather than coarsening and crudening and deadening it if you do the positive things rather than the negative things. It's a good working hypothesis, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So let's talk about demons. Let's talk about the devil. Let's mm -hmm. talk about uh, that. That stirs up a lot of controversy with folks. It's amazing for me that I can talk about these other issues that we just spoke about, and you get a different kind of skepticism, a different kind of pushback. But as soon as you start saying, I don't have any direct experience with demons or evil beings or negative beings or, or any of that stuff. But I've encountered enough people on the show who've said, hey, this is a reality that I, I encountered because I went outside of my body and this is what I, I saw, this is what I experienced. What do you make? What do you make of that? And I've put it in the last couple of shows in this context of, you know, do we live in a demon haunted world? Is that another aspect of our experience that we have to, 
I don't want to say worry about, but we would worry about it. I mean, how, how do we deal with that? Um, first of all, I've had a couple of experiences, both sides, positive and negative. They could have been written off as dreams, but they seem kind of real at the time. And we'll talk about them if you want. But secondly, the, the broader principle is that you know this whole idea of there being subtler realms of creation that we've alluded to, and we've kind of used physics as an example, but in terms of you know, our actually capacity to experience them, there are subtler realms of creation. And those who do experience them uh, may encounter various uh, forms of life that dwell on those levels um, and dwell exclusively on those levels. Whereas human beings are able to, to, to traverse the whole range in terms of their experience, there are certain types of beings which only live on uh, certain subtle levels, astral, or celestial, and so on. And... Um, the reason some people experience them is that they begin. You, you know Jack O'Keefe. I don't know if you have watched my interview with her, but she was sitting Not in a pub, she was sitting in a pub in Ireland, and you know, having a beer. She was an atheist, and all of a sudden, kapow! She saw spooks all over the room, floating in the air. Totally freaked her out. You can listen to her interview for an elaboration, but it, it opened her up to this whole world of possibilities that she didn't know existed. And one le thing led to the next, and she eventually kind of got on to becoming a non-dual realizer and teacher. But anyway, that's my take on it, that, that there are numerous strata of creation and the subtle strata um, may contain beings both positive and negative and um, that is open to experiential verification. Yeah, you got to go there. Tell us. Well, oh, in terms of my own experience? Uh, experiential verification. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I believe in a lot of things that I haven't verified experientially, like the whole UFO phenomenon. Um, I think it's real, but I have no direct experience of it. But in terms of these two little experiences, uh, and again, they could be written off as dreams, but they seem very vivid. Um, one was I was in Biarritz, France on a course, a meditation course, doing a lot of long meditations, and... Um, it was kind of stormy, but there was something kind of ominous about the storminess. And, and Marishi told us to keep our windows closed. And I, being a rebellious sort, opened my window because I wanted the fresh air. And during the night, this, this witch-like being kind of came and attacked me and started ra grabbing at my neck. And I started mentally doing a puja, which is a well, ceremony of uh, gratitude. And that, the positivity of that uh, dispersed that influence. And so... Totally could be a bad dream. Who knows? But it seemed there's something more to it in my, you know, it seemed. The positive one was um, maybe five years later. Um, I'd been meditating about a dozen years at this time. And again, I was asleep. And I had this experience where I was taken by the hand and led into a room by what seemed to be a benign being. And may, I asked to lie down on my stomach on a pallet and hold on to some handles. And I was then worked over up and down my spine with some kind of implement up and down. And it was excruciating and, and kind of like incredibly intense. But I held on for dear life. And I came up out of this thing with the most profound uh, metamorphosis I had ever experienced. There was just this sense that I had been bound with iron bands all of my life and that those bands had been broken. There was mm. a tremendous relief and gratitude and bliss. And, you know, really a, it was an awakening to the self, to the absolute. There was, I was completely grounded in that. Um, and, you know, living in this state of wonder for days afterwards. And so it, it almost seemed like a kind of... A, intervention by some kind of um, subtle and very benign intelligence. Again, could be written off as a dream, but that was my experience. Hey, that's, that's a great story. Hey, hey, Rick, share with us, I know this is probably like picking favorite children, but for folks who are new to Buddha at the Gas Pump are going to dip in, of course they should go wherever they feel they're drawn, but give us a sampling of some of the shows that you think your 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 new listeners might find most interesting? Oh, there are so many, and I don't want to play favorites, you know, because I really like all these people, and I form a bond with them, but just off the top of my head, in fact, I'm calling up my site now so I can scan down the list. The site's a little slow to come up. L l then, yeah. You know, that's an unfair question, so uh -huh. let me ask it a different way. What are some of the most popular shows that other folks have found? Okay, Adyashanti, starting at the top of the list, was one of the most popular. 
uh, has had a lot of hits. Anita Murjani, who had the near-death experience, you probably know of Anita. She was very popular. Um, let's see, there are a number of other ones. Muji, I think, is a great guy, a beautiful teacher, and his his interview was very popular. Um, scanning down the list here. I particularly like a good friend of mine, Igor Kufayev, um, who's from... Uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, we've become good personal friends, and you know, gotten together at a conference and all. I did two interviews with him. Eli Ruzdar, a very sweet woman from Iran, and uh, people really liked her interview, and uh, she's very popular. A lot of people like the Gangaji interview. Um, I'm really skipping down the list here. There's so Maybe many. that's enough. You're going to drive my transcriber nuts right yeah. there. Yeah, I just got through the first part of the alphabet. I'm scanning down the list alphabetically. But um, anyway, no slight to the people I didn't mention. There are 163 of them now. But uh, you know, those might be a good place to start. Uh, you know, as we wrap things up here, and, and I want to hear any other uh, thoughts that you have on topics we might have mm -hmm. missed, but there's um, a great Zen uh, little little idea that was shared with me by, uh, by a listener, and it reminded me, I guess I've heard it before, but it's great to be reminded, you know, and I'd like to hear your comment on it, you know, before enlightenment, fetch, wood and chop, uh, fetch water and chop wood, after enlightenment, fetch water and chop wood. Mm -hmm. uh, what, does that, what does that mean to you? Do you ascribe to that, and, and how, do you, how do you take that? Yeah, it just means that the relative aspects of your life are not going to necessarily undergo um, an obvious transformation when enlightenment dawns. You might still be working in the same job and married to the same person and raising the same kids and everything else, but there's an inner transformation which could be um, quite dramatic uh, if somebody else were able to step into your shoes and see through your eyes. They would they would realize that something incredibly profound had taken place, but it wouldn't necessarily be apparent on the surface. You know, that, that's awesome, and, and I, also take it a, I also take it a slightly uh, different way, and that's that to the extent that I see myself as different, I'm kind of falling for the trap, too, that, you know, what I was is still there, too, so I have to keep fetching water and chopping wood because that's what I am in this body and, and we're going to be on this mission for as long as, as we're given this time and that's what we do. We fetch yeah. wood, chop water. And don't if you, if you don't, you're going to get thirsty and freeze. That's right. <laughs> Rick, uh, tell folks anything else that we might want to know about uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump. Any thoughts you have about where the show might be going? And uh, any conferences you just mentioned that, that you might be at or how people can get in touch with you? Okay. I'd like to throw one thing out before we do that because that's kind of a wrap-up sure. point, if you don't mind taking another few minutes. Of course. And it's a little game that I play with myself all the time. Quite, I find myself doing it quite spontaneously, and I call it Cosmic Zoom Lens. <laughs> and here's the game. You know, uh, zoom out to the level of uh, you know, a perspective where you can watch the Andromeda galaxy collide with the Milky Way over the next 8 billion years. And realize, of course, that that's actually a very, very tiny localized event compared to the whole universe, but it's big enough for our purposes here. And then imagine as you watch that over 8 billion years, all the trillions and trillions of lives playing themselves out on all the inhabited planets in those galaxies. Just, uh, uh, and each, of which, each one of those lives seems very real and serious to the person living them. But from that perspective, they're all like little, little fireflies winking in and out, even faster than that. Little billions, trillions of little strobe lights going on and off. Um, okay, now zoom it down, past the human level, down to the level of the Planck scale and you discover there is no universe. It's just all a field of pure potentiality in which even a cubic centimeter of empty space at that level has more energy than all the energy in the entire manifest universe. Just incredible potential. And, you know, and that's essentially what you are. Now zoom it back to the human level, and here's what you are in an expressed form, in a manifest living form. But this perspective, as a human being, is no more real, really, than the, the zoomed-out cosmic perspective or the, you know, the zoomed-in Planck scale perspective. Those are just different perspectives on reality. And we just have a peephole as a human being, just a little peephole. And yet, you know, we can actually uh, culture 
an awareness that is cosmic like that, that does sort of transcend time and space, that's vast, that's eternal. That can be our living reality. That can be the sort of the, the substance of our life. And that's what enlightenment is all about, which is the question you started this interview with. Um, and it's not a pipe dream. It's not a fantasy. It's something that many people have lived throughout history and something that uh, we would have a very interesting world on our hands if it were commonplace. Uh, all the problems and, and travails that you know beset us as a civilization today would be just distant memories if that were a common experience. Rather a very optimistic uh, view of things, that, and that's, that's wonderful, that things can get better, and I guess you've said before that you believe that there is a movement towards things moving in that direction. That is your sense of things. And that plays into your previous question about Buddha at the gas pump. Yes, I feel, you know, very unscientifically, you know, just uh, perhaps anecdotally, that there is definitely a movement in that direction. There's a quickening, there's an awakening. It's going like popcorn. I remember when I was a kid, I, uh, I, I saw a science show on TV where they had a whole big room full of mouse traps that were all set, and each mouse trap had a ping pong ball on it. And they set off one mouse trap. I think it was meant to um, illustrate nuclear fusion or something. They set up one mouse trap, and the ping pong ball bounced and set off another mouse trap. And then the, pretty soon the whole room was just mouse traps going off with ping pong balls flying everywhere. So I think there's a kind of a um, there's a kind of an epidemic taking place, and I. Uh, we could speculate as to the causes of it. It might be j just that there's this kind of a, a bubbling up from the, the basis of life that's just, you know, you know, just as if the ground in a forest somehow becomes more nutritious with some rain or something, then all the plants start to thrive. Or it could be somehow that, you know, the plants themselves are, are helping each other to stretch the analogy that one awakened person is helping to awaken other people. But whatever the mechanics, I, I think it's happening. And I think, it, and it, it, I feel totally optimistic. I don't get bummed by, uh, you know, the various uh, dire predictions for the world because I feel that, as we also said earlier in the interview, radical transformations can take place in society which are totally unforeseen by the vast majority of people. And, um, you know, maybe wishful thinking, but I kind of feel like we're on the cusp of such a, a transformation. And it, it may not even come in our lifetimes, but it very well may. And, and whether or not it does, it can come in any one individual's lifetime. You don't have to wait for the whole society to transform. You can enjoy heaven on earth now yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Great, great. So, and then I think that does tie into your mission, what you're doing at Boot at the Gas Pump, which... Again, it's great. You got to go check it out. I think just let serendipity take its course. Pick a couple interviews and see if you get hooked. W what's coming up for you with the show? Any changes, future directions? And what about conferences or if people wanted to connect with you personally? Um, there's contact info for me on the site, although I have to um, be a little bit restrictive as to how much I can engage in email with people because I do have a full-time job so I can't get into sometimes people send me big long things I don't even have a chance to read them much less to respond to them and I don't mean to be rude you know but I, I, I work full-time and I do this on top of that and have a family and you know other things so I can't interact too much with people but um, I, I will be at a conference this fall the science and non-duality conference in uh, San Jose, California. I've gone for the last two years and it's been a lot of fun when a number of BatGap listeners are going to try to get out there so we can have our own little, you know, conclave within the conference. Um, so scienceandnonduality.com if you want to check that out. And uh, as far as plans for the show are concerned, I'm still waiting for Oprah to call. She hasn't called yet for uh -huh. some reason. <laughs> I figure I could do Super Soul Monday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> but um, I would certainly like, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I don't feel like working for the rest of my life at something that I is not intrinsically meaningful to me. Um, as, as much as people need search engine optimization, there are others who can do it for them. So I would, I would enjoy having this morph into something that could support me full time, and I can do it till the day I die.
And it's, it's like one of those things where, you know, would you keep doing what you're doing if you won the lottery? Um, you know, most people would quit their jobs. I certainly wouldn't quit doing this. I would do it more. Hey, that, that, that really says it all. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful site, a great, great service. It's tremendous that uh, this has been enabled by the Internet and that that opportunity has been taken advantage of and filled in. We, we live in a wonderful age, and, uh, and it's shows like this, good at the gas pump, that make it possible for us to really celebrate the materialism and the, the, some of the stuff that goes with it. It's been great having you on, Rick. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. Thanks, Alex. It's been great, and uh, we'll be in touch. I'm going to keep listening to your show. And um, I'm really enjoying it. Super.